Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, and we're streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube, where those videos are available to watch anytime afterwards. And if you've not already silenced your phone, please do that now. On Saturday, June 17th, we'll have a special screening of The Crisis, the oldest surviving feature film to have been shot in Mississippi. Released in 1916, the silent film tells the story of the Civil War and the struggle to end slavery. A new score has been commissioned for the film, and an orchestra will perform that score live here in the auditorium, so I hope that we'll see you then. And I hope that you'll join us next week for History's Lunch when Tim Smith will present 10 Things I've Learned Studying Vicksburg. This is home. Medgar Evers, Mississippi and the Movement is now open upstairs. The exhibit marks the 60th anniversary of the assassination of Medgar Evers and covers his early life and family, his career with the NAACP, and his lasting legacy. And it is, of course, in conjunction with that anniversary that we have today's History's Lunch. We're delighted to welcome Rena Evers Everett and former Evers Fellows T. Dion Bailey, Bobby J. Smith II, and Pamela N. Walker to present the Evers Archive, Voices, Justice, Legacies. Bailey Smith and Walker are former recipients of the Medgar and Murley Evers Research Fellowship, and they each worked in the Evers Collection at the Winter Building next door. Today we'll hear from each of them about their interactions with the Evers family, their work in the archives, and what the collection holds for future researchers. We'll also hear from Rena Evers Everett, who will talk about her family and the collection, and this week. Rena Evers Everett is the Executive Director of the Medgar and Murley Evers Institute. She earned her BS in Business Merchandising from the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York. Evers Everett is a W.K. Kellogg Foundation Global Fellow and Chair of the Sojourn Project, a moving classroom immersion program. T. Dion Bailey is Assistant Professor of History at Colgate University. She earned her BA from Reinhardt University in Waleska, Georgia, and her MA and PhD in U.S. History from the University of Mississippi. Bobby J. Smith II is Assistant Professor in the Department of African American Studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, currently on research leave as a Fellow of the National Endowment for the Humanities. He earned his B.S. in Agriculture from Prairie View A&M University and his M.S. in Agricultural Economics and Ph.D. in Developmental Sociology, both from Cornell University. Last, we'll hear from Pamela N. Walker, who is an assistant professor of African American history at the University of Vermont. She earned her BA from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, her MA in history from the University of New Orleans, and her PhD in African American and women's history from Rutgers University, New Brunswick. Help me welcome Rena Evers Everett. Good afternoon. It's a glorious afternoon. I get to see so many wonderful, familiar family, extended family. Thank you for being here, truly. It is my pleasure to be with you. And it's going to be a pleasure to be with our Evers Fellows. I'm not going to take up a lot of time. I just, because they're such an astounding group, you really want to hear what they have done. But I have to tell you that Mississippi Department of Archives and History has been just the most tremendous, phenomenal partner you can have. So I thank Katie Blunt, who's the director. I thank Laura Heller, who heads up this wonderful group. And there's so many others, all staff, all volunteers of these two wonderful museums. We thank you for doing what you do to shed the good light, the true light of Mississippi on everyone who comes. It is, as Chris Goodwin said, the 60th anniversary of my father's assassination. It is a bitter, bitter sweet memory. Bitter because of the tragedy 
that my brothers, my mother and I witness June 12th on our carport with my father being gunned down in his blood, but holding T-shirts that really spoke to what he did, which was Jim Crow must go. With these fellows coming to Mississippi to do the research in our collection, the Evers Collection, they went through different areas that were included into our papers. So you hear about food, you hear about politics, you'll hear about home. All of that is included and makes the 360 of Medgar Evers. So without further ado, I would love to present to you the Evers Archives, Voices, Justice, Legacies, which also echoes our 60th theme, which is Voices of Courage and Justice that's happening this week. So please join us on the adventure, on the education, on the enlightenment of courage and justice, starting now with Dion Bailey. Welcome, Ms. Dion. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my absolute honor to be here with you all. I would like to sincerely thank Mrs. Evers Williams, um, Ms. Rena Evers Everett, the Medgar and Murley Evers Institute and the Research Fellowship Program, as well as the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, especially when I was there, my time there, uh, Katie Blunt and Laura Heller, for developing and executing such an important opportunity for scholars such as ourselves to engage in the work that will continuously bring to the forefront the voices of the civil rights movement while also helping to shed light on the legacies of the Evers family. I would also like to take this time to sincerely thank Chris Goodwin for helping to bring us all together for such a momentous um, occasion. And so today I have titled my, titled my talk, um, The Heart of the Evers Archive, Reclaiming Voices, Fighting for Justice, and Upholding the family, upholding family and historical legacies. As a daughter of the South, I was born and raised and received all of my formal education in a small Northwest Georgia uh, town known as Rome. After undergrad, I ventured just over 300 miles east uh, um, to Oxford, Mississippi, where I earned both my master's and PhD in history. And as a point of reflection for me, I must be brutally honest um, with you all and say that it was during my graduate studies that I really began to learn about Medgar Evers. Yes, I had heard Evers' name before in connection to other civil rights activists during their time in Mississippi. However, I did not fully learn about the life and work um, of Evers until graduate school. A fellow classmate was writing his dissertation on Medgar Evers and would share some of his work by way of department talks and classroom discussions. Not only was I shocked to learn about Medgar Evers, I was also dismayed that my primary and secondary education had failed to teach me all about the, power, the different pioneers of the movement, as well as the importance of Mississippi in the context of American history. I was even more shocked to learn that a university that I was enrolled in never really spoke about denying Medgar Evers admission into the University of Mississippi's Law School in 1954, 
Um, as the most common conversation, as you all probably know, um, was all about James Meredith. So to that end, I knew that my work would center the histories of African Americans in the American South. I decided quickly that I wanted to be a scholar that worked to include all narratives that would help tell a complete history of African Americans because I felt that I had not truly learned about the civil rights movement, having never been taught about Medgar Evers, Fannie Lou Hamer, Amzie Moore, Aaron Henry, Ann Moody, just to name a few. And it was during my graduate studies that I also began to hear and read about Parchman Penitentiary, yet never learning about the incarceration of thousands of black girls and women in Mississippi who were housed at the state's penal farm because the narrative only centered around black boys and men. And even some people didn't even know um, that, and even today, that women, girls, and black girls and women and, um, were, were housed at Parchman. So my work then would give specific attention to African-American girls and women in an effort to help recover the voices of those that history and popular historical narratives most often overlook. Thus, as a scholar of African-American history, my work examines the lived experiences of African-American girls and women in the Southern carceral system, just like this picture you see here of incarcerated Black girls and women um, sewing in Parchman Penitentiary around 1930. I pay specific attention uh, to Mississippi's notorious Parchman Penitentiary because of its brutality and the way in which it treated um, African-Americans. And it was during my two-year postdoctoral fellowship at the Carter G. Woodson Institute for African-American and African Studies at the University of Virginia in 2017, from 2017 to 2019 that I first learned about the Medgar and Murley Evers Research Scholars Program, even though I was not new to MDAH because I had spent countless times there conducting research, combing through primary sources, including newspapers, governor's papers, governor's, uh, government records and documents. I scanned everything that I could find to learn more about the lost voices of Black girls and women who were incarcerated at Parchman. And the reality is they were hidden, right? No one was really actually talking about them. They were talking through them about how they were expo uh, uh, Ex sort of exposing their labor and their bodies, so exploiting them. So during those trips that I will always think about accessing the Metgar, Wiley, and Murley Beasley's Evers papers, but I could never make myself fully understand how they might help in my, how this collection might help in my own research. And honestly, I was working so hard just to complete the dissertation that I, I just did not have a clear vision at that moment. However, once I began the revision process to turn my dissertation into a book-length manuscript, I received an email announcing the 2018 Ever Scholars Program. And that was, it was then that I really began to think about and truly reimagine my own work. So tentatively, tentatively titled Daughters of Jim Crow's Injustice, African-American Women, Mass Incarceration, and the Business of Black Women's Bodies at Parchman Penitentiary from 1890 to 1980, through a feminist critique of crime and punishment, I seek to recover the voices of Black girls and women who have historically been um, at the center of Mississippi's penal and labor systems. The manuscript examines the complex history of African-American girls and women in, parchment in, in prison and parchment from 1890 to 1980. And it is in this period that incarcerated African-American girls and women face multiple forms of political, social, economic, and legal exploitation at the hands of a Southern society that profited from both their punishment and labor while exploiting their sexuality. So by highlighting these girls and women as major actors in the carceral state, my work illustrates just how the intersections of race, class, and gender significantly influenced how peniology functioned in the South. So chapter three is where we sort of, I start sort of thinking about and how I 
really dove into the Evers papers. So the title of chapter three in my manuscript is titled, it was like I was in a new world, black girls and women, freedom riders, and the price of their gender incarceration at Parchman Penitentiary during 1961. And this is what drove me to apply for the to be an Evers Scholars. I wanted to learn all I could about Megger Evers, the civil rights movement, and see if there was any connection between the Freedom Riders and Evers. So during the summer of 2018, I came to the archives very excited to dive into the Evers collection and see what I could learn. And oh, what a true blessing this really was. Of the month that I was in the archives, I spent countless hours combing through the collection, which was rich and filled with invaluable information. I found that the correspondence papers, speeches, personal handwritten papers, and photographs have reshaped not only how I think about my work, but how I think about my own connection to my family, the Evers family, social injustice, violence, and the historical legacies of individuals who the world might not know otherwise. And as I went through each box meticulously, I felt such a strong attachment to the collection and to the Evers family. I truly felt connected to and held a deep sense of responsibility of doing right by the collection and making sure that I was fully present and allowed the papers to speak to me and not simply just comb through looking for the ways that the collection could help me. While I did find information related to the 1961 Freedom Rise, what I learned and took away from my time with the collection was that the papers are more than just research material. The Medgar Wiley and Merle Beasley Evers paper shed light on the dynamic lives and work of a family who was and still is determined to fight for racial e equality and full civil rights for all. The collection meant so much to me that I've gone back since and I've just spent time with the collection, looking through the documents and the papers, not even taking one note, right? Just spending time with the collection. So in closing, I cannot stress just how important the Everest Collection is and will continue to be. This is the reason why under any circumstance, I could not be I could not be a part of such a wonderful event that is commemorating the life and legacy of Medgar Evers, Merle Evers Williams, and their family. It was and still is an honor to be an Evers scholar, and I will always be indebted to the ways in which the collection helped me grow both personally and professionally. The collection is filled with resources that are just waiting for others to tap into. And it is my honest opinion that anyone who is serious about the civil rights movement, justice, equality, Mississippi history, family history and legacies, eradicating racism, eradicating injustice and striking down Jim Crow that we still continuously see vestiges of today, that they should make use of a source such as a resource such as the Everest Collection, one which is. Um, a collection that the Evers family has so graciously shared with us all. So thank you so much. And now I would like to turn the stage over to my colleague, Dr. Bobby Smith. Thank you, Dion. I am truly excited to be here um, sharing the virtual stage with you all. Um, again, my name is Dr. Bobby J. Smith II. I'm the assistant professor in the Department of African American Studies. I'm greetings from Champaign, Illinois. Um, in preparing for this talk, I became overwhelmed with thankfulness and gratefulness. Um, we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago um, to discuss this event. And I told Rena, and I want to say this here, is that the, the Everest Fellowship changed the trajectory of my academic career. Um, at the time that I became an Everest Fellow, I was recently in a PhD program in development sociology at Cornell, and I had recently learned about 
um, food in the civil rights movement. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but I just want to thank the Everest family. I want to thank um, everyone at the archives um, there at NDH. I don't want to begin to name names uh, because if I name names, I might leave someone out. But for those who were there when I was in Mississippi some six years ago, this very week, six years ago, um, thank you for all that you did, for the conversations, for, for pointing me in different directions, which ended up being in all the right directions around the story that I sought to tell through my experience at the archive. So um, in the interest of time, I'll be right into my talk and I look forward to the Q&A um, discussion at the end. So the title of my presentation today is The Everest Archives, Sound Bites from the Food Frontlines of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. Um, during my time in Mississippi, when I came to Mississippi some six years ago this week, I came wanting to understand how did food play a role in the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. When many people think about the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement, we tend to think about issues of voting rights, issues of education, issues of segregation um, in public accommodations. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to recover what I saw as a food story of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. And many may wonder, how did I even get into thinking about food as a story? What, what, what does it mean to bring food into the conversation about the Civil Rights Movement? What are the food front lines of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement? And to begin, I, I wanted to go back to how it all started. Six years ago this week, I moved to Mississippi for June of 2017, and I became um, the Everest Research Scholar there. Um, but my journey to becoming the Everest Research Scholar started with a book. Um, the book you see on the screen is I've Got the Light of Freedom, The Organized Tradition and the Mississippi Freedom Struggle by Charles Payne. This book is an important book for anyone who wants to study the movement, anyone who wants to understand the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. Charles Payne's book is a seminal text. He takes careful time to think about what does the organized tradition mean in Mississippi and how does Mississippi help us understand the entire world? But to understand the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement requires us to also understand the importance of the Evers family, particularly Megger and Merle Evers. Megger devoted his entire life, his career, to thinking about freedom in Mississippi while he began his time um, when he was in Mount Bayou working for an insurance company. When he transitioned into thinking about civil rights activism and going into that work, he devoted his time to thinking about what does freedom mean in Mississippi. Charles Payne takes time to think about Megger Evers and think about his contributions to the movement, but also thinking about his contributions in LaFleur County, in Greenwood, Mississippi. My first time thinking about my first time thinking about I've Got Land of Freedom was in a class when I was a graduate student at Cornell University. I was taking a class on community organizing and development, and my professor there said, "Everyone needs to read this book by Charles Payne because it not only helps us think about the organized tradition, but it helps us think about Mississippi and the civil rights movement." If anyone's read Charles Payne's book, it's on 400 pages, and it's a great book to read. But within 10 pages of that book, I discovered a food story of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. In Chapter 5 of Payne Books, he talks about what is known as the Greenwood Food Blockade. The Greenwood Food Blockade becomes important because it's a moment where food becomes central to the movement. Prior to this Greenwood Food Blockade that occurred in 1962, 1963, food was not really necessarily an important part of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. While people understood the importance of food and knew, knew that food had been used in numbers of ways during the movement, food did not become central to the movement until the Greenwood Food Blockade of 1962. And later I'll talk about what the Greenwood Food Blockade was. But the reason why I bring up the Greenwood Food Blockade is because the context in which we begin to think about these food front lines of the movement occurs in what is known as the Yazoo, Mississippi Delta region of the state of Mississippi, which is the northwest quadrant of the state. The Yazoo Mississippi Delta region is an important region because not only is it important to thinking about the nation and thinking about agriculture and food, it's also important in thinking about the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement and the national movement. The Delta was the birthplace of what is known as the White Citizens Council, which was the emblematic white supremacist group of the civil rights era and also in the state of Mississippi. It also was a site where SNCC moved his headquarters in 1962 to think about how do we organize around issues of voting rights and education. But in the Yazoo, Mississippi Delta was when food became an important part of the movement. But why is Greenwood so important? Why is LaFleur County so important? Again, I'm providing sound bites of thinking about this food front lines because I want to situate the context in which we began to think about the movement. 
Not only was it important, not only was the Delta important because of the White Citizens Council and also because of SNCC moving their headquarters there, it was also important because it's one of the first times we began to think about the civil rights movement in the context of plantation economics. To understand the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement in a rural context, we have to understand what the plantation economy did. Megar Evers and Merle Evers in, in their writings and their speeches always talked about or always referenced in thinking about how the Delta played this important role in the movement and how the plantation economy created conditions whereby sharecroppers were dependent on their plantation owners for every aspect of their lives. Therefore, when we begin to think about the, 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 the Delta and we begin to think about the civil rights movement, we think about the, the, the ways in which this region is so important, food becomes extremely important. But Greenwood was an actual a model for the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. In fact, Megar Ever speaks in 1963, one of his last speeches he gives in the spring of 1963 in Greenwood, Mississippi, he states, I just want to say to you that the reason I'm up here in Greenwood is because you have given us inspiration in Jackson and we're going back to Jackson, South Mississippi and all over Mississippi and fight for freedom as you're fighting for it here in Greenwood. We're going to win this fight for freedom. So why is Greenwood important? Why did Megar Evers believe that if, 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 the, if, if Greenwood could be a model, then we could win this fight for freedom? I would argue that what becomes important here is that in 1962 and 1963, the Delta becomes this battleground. The Mississippi County that this, that this New York Times article is speaking about is LaFleur County. LaFleur County becomes important because it is a battleground, but it's not a battleground only because the White Sisters Council is located there, because SNCC has moved their headquarters there. But it also becomes a battleground because food becomes an important part of this struggle. In the fall of 1962, the LaFleur County Board of Supervisors decides to dismantle what is known as the USDA's, or what was known as the USDA's Commodity Surplus, Surplus Commodities Food Program. Many people are familiar with this program when you think about government cheese and you think about government peanut butter. And this program is important because this was one of the only ways that sharecroppers were able to supplement their meager diets on plantation grounds. Again, to understand the, the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement in the Yazoo Mississippi Delta requires us to understand plantation economics. So sharecroppers are dependent on this government food program for their food needs. But the rise of SNCC removing their headquarters into Greenwood and then also the tensions around voting rights and education and all these tensions in, in downtown of Florida County, we begin to see this struggle becomes to it becomes a, a, a critical moment because what happens is food enters into the conversation when the LaFleur County Board of Supervisors decides to dismantle this program. In response, activists organize what is known as a Food for Freedom program. And what's interesting is about this Food for Freedom program is that it becomes a moment where food takes precedent in the movement. The picture in the center there is a woman named by the name of Mrs. Ella Edwards. And she becomes important because she helps us begin to think about how food was important, how everyday people began to organize around food in the movement. So Greenwood becomes a site of a ballot battle. But what's interesting about this food story is that while the Greenwood story and while the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement, at least between 1962 and 1963, is about food, food never becomes a major part of the national narrative. Those on the ground understand food. Megar Evers understands about food because June Johnson reports that Megar Evers spent a lot of time bringing food from Jackson to Greenwood throughout his time when he was spending his time in the Delta in the early 1960s. Therefore, food is important, but this food story never makes a national narrative. It never makes national conversation. But those who were on the ground understood the importance of food. They understood that while the LaFleur County Board of Supervisors thought that by taking food away from the movement, they would starve people into submission. In fact, this is what happens when we believe, when we start to think about food as a weapon against the movement. We've heard about a number of other weapons against the movement, but what happens when food becomes a weapon? Food becomes important because if you can starve the movement out, then you can make people do a number of things that they might not want to do. Therefore, therefore, my research in coming to Mississippi as an Evers archive was to uh, to become an Evers research scholar was to understand this food story. What I liked about the Evers scholarship at the time when I heard about it was that not only was it about using the Evers archive to understand the, the civil rights movement in Mississippi, but it was also using the Evers archive as a window into uh, other stories about the movement. It was a window for me to begin to think about what would a food story of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement look like? How do we begin to understand 
food as a form of voter suppression, but also food as a form of freedom. Activists understood that we also have to feed people in order to organize around these issues that they're facing. But again, we're thinking about it in a rural context. Food becomes extremely important because everything about the system constrained the lives of Black people, including when, where, and how they could access food. What's important about this story is that when we begin to think about food access in the movement, we open ourselves up to different stories about the movement. And my time as an ever scholar really gave me the opportunity to begin to think about what this food story was. In 2017, I didn't know a lot about the food story. I learned about the food story and I wrote about this idea of a Greenwood food blockade. But this Greenwood food blockade was an entry point into a larger conversation about how food shaped the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. This conversation evolved into what is now my book project, which is known as Food Power Politics, The Food Story of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. This book is the inaugural monograph of the Black Food Justice Series, the newly launched Black Food Justice Series at the University of North Carolina Press. I bring this up because this book would not be here, would not be published in August if it wasn't for my time in Mississippi as an Everest scholar, now an Everest fellow. My time in Mississippi paved the way for this food story to come to life, and I am forever grateful to the Everest family and those who I worked with in Mississippi to bring this story into life. I won't talk a lot about the book because of the interest of time, but I just want to say that this food story that I seek to tell seeks to reconfigure or reorient how we think about the movement. Alongside our, our narratives around when we rehearse the story of the movement around voting rights, we think about education, we think about Freedom Summer. I also want us to think about this food story that begins with the Greenwood food blockade, but opens us up to larger conversations. What's also interesting about my time while I was in Mississippi was that I also got a chance to meet a number of activists. During my time there, I met an activist by the name of Dr. Doris Derby, who unexpectedly passed away last year. Dr. Derby was an important movement activist, and she also was a photographer. In fact, the cover of my book is, is, is a reimagination of a picture she took of the movement at the time in the late 1960s around a food cooperative that was organized in the context of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. I thank Dr. Derby because I met her during that summer, and I thank the Everest Archive and also the Everest family for giving me an opportunity to actually come to Mississippi and to learn this story and to meet people like Dr. Doris Derby. So in conclusion, as I said before, this talk, this brief talk is about sound bites from the food front lines of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. If I think about conclusions, if I think about the voices, if I think about justice and legacies, I want us to also understand how the Everest Archive is an entry point into thinking about the food front lines of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. But these food front lines also help us understand issues today around the prevalence of racism and inequality in the production, consumption, and distribution of food. What we do know is even today, Mississippi is the most food insecure state in our nation, which means that the food front lines of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement paved the way for us to begin to think about how do we overcome these types of issues around food in Mississippi. Therefore, I'm eternally grateful, as I've said before, to be in conversation with both Dion and Pamela, and I'm excited for the Q&A session where we can talk more about the Evers Archive, the Evers Legacy, and what it means for us today in the context of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement and its legacies. Thank you. I will now turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Pamela Walker. Hi, everyone. Thank you for that um, transition, Bobby. Thank you all for being here. I am honored to be counted among these exceptional scholars of Mississippi history. I want to thank everyone at the Evers Institute, uh, especially Rena, for her generosity and for the work that you're doing, honoring and preserving the legacy of your parents and creating opportunities for rising scholars to study Mississippi in new and innovative ways. I want to thank my friends at the two museums and MDAH for the warm welcome around four years ago, I think that I was, and for their ongoing friendship. And I want to thank Chris for his coordination of this event. There are many others that I could thank, um, and my gratitude extends to everyone in Mississippi who aided me in this work. I say that because Mississippi is home for me. I am the granddaughter and daughter of Mississippi Deltans from Moorhead, to be exact. My earliest years of school were spent in Vicksburg. 
My grandmothers on both sides were mothers of large families, raising 20 children between the two of them. They were cotton choppers. They were cooks from the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. They were not activists, and they had never spoken to me about the movement. And so I came to this work really through a conversation with my grandmother by asking her about the fabric scraps and the quilted aprons that she wore all of my life. And to my surprise, she told me that um, the fabric scraps had come from a white lady named Anne who lived in Connecticut. And so this put me on a path to examining cross-racial connections between families in Mississippi and outside of the South and specifically led me to kind of thinking about the way that Black women in the South and white women outside of the South were using the postal system to be a part of the movement and to access or provide survival goods, some of those survival goods that Bobby was speaking about. So I'll share my screen um, to kind of get into some of the things that I, I discovered um, in the archive. Um, I'll give you a, a little bit of an introduction of my own work and the ways that the Evers Archive shifted um, my thinking and my work to think about emotion and sympathy and empathy and how that functioned within the movement. And so I'm currently working on a book called Signs Still Delivered, How Black and White Mothers Use the Box Project and the Postal System to Fight Hunger and Feed the Mississippi Freedom Movement. And it examines motherhood, race, benevolence, letter writing, political consciousness, it tells an illuminating story of ordinary women and Black women's, white and Black women's overlooked participation in the movement through um, the postal system. And one of the main sources that I engage with for this project is an archive called the Box Project Collection, which was a grassroots postal anti-poverty program that brought about hundreds of unlikely connections between rural Black women and Northern women. Virginia Nave was the woman who founded this organization. She was from Vermont. She was an artist and a pacifist, a human rights activist who founded this project in 1963. And she was inspired by her conversations with Claire Collins Harvey during a disarmament conference um, in Switzerland. And through these conversations, through um, Ms. Harvey's connections in Mississippi, um, she came up with this idea of fighting Southern poverty by connecting Northern women with Southern women. And more than 6,000 folks were exchanging goods and letters through the postal system by 1970. These letters um, provide a window for me into the world of ordinary women, um, ordinary Black women during the civil rights movement, not just major events, um, but the really quotidian quiet moments of hope and possibility during and after the movement. And so my work is primarily focused on looking at these Delta women um, and how they were often kind of relegated to the backdrop of the movement. But I'm also kind of thinking about how out outsiders are engaging with the movement, how media, specifically around Black families in Mississippi, how news of the Evers also brought outsiders into the movement, movement to contribute and to support the movement in their, the ways that they saw fit. And so I entered the Evers Archive with this foundation, having my primary base within the Box Project, but also wanting to try to figure out and discover other types of cross-racial writing, other types of connections between Black and white women, during this area, era so that I could contextualize the box project. While I was at um, NDAH, I looked at many collections. I spent quite a bit of time in the Evers archive, but I specifically examined Mrs. Evers' manuscript collection and her biography. And what I discovered in her collection um, expanded my dissertation now book in a number of ways and specifically it really encouraged me to think about the way that sympathy and empathy were functioning within some of this cross-racial writing and how benevolence was a function of how outsiders were attempting to participate. And I'll talk a bit about that because one of the main ways that I was engaging in this archive was combing through many of the sympathy letters 
that were written to Mrs. Evers. All of this was pushing me to kind of think about how media was functioning in Mississippi, how media functioned outside of Mississippi to raise the consciousness of outsiders who were sympathetic to the movement and how these, these types of interactions cultivated um, and encouraged sympathizers to contribute in material ways toward the movement. And so some of the letters that I was looking for, I had hundreds of letters in the Box Project, thousands of letters in the Box Project from Black women, but I didn't have access to what some of these white women who were sending alms and, and materials, um, hand-me-down clothing, canned goods to Black families, I didn't have a sense of why they were engaging in this way. And so I looked at these sympathy letters that had been written um, to Mrs. Evers to kind of get access to why these women were, were drawn to the movement. The majority of the sympathy letters, at least the ones that I examined that were visible to me in the collection, were written by the Box Project demographic. They were these middle-class Northern white women. And the outpouring was precipitous. Most of these letters were written on June 12th and the 13th, the day these women heard the news of Megger Evers' assassination. And I argue in my work that this serves as a catalyst for many of these women's awareness of the movement and their desire to engage in the movement. And I suggest that it also becomes this way that many of these women choose afterward to kind of engage in the movement through benevolence, through um, charity and donations. Mass media was a critical way um, that people were introduced to Evers in the 1960s, especially folks outside of the state. The um, WLBT speech was a milestone for Southern public Southern broadcast, but the June 1st um, profile of Evers in the New York Times um, really um, spoke to many folks outside of the South. They uh, called him the, the, the title of this publication was Quiet Integrationist, and they profiled this handsome image illuminating his time as a college athlete, a World War II veteran, the state secretary at the NAACP. At that same, around the same time, President Kennedy is addressing the nation on civil rights, um, and he's urging Congress to act. Um, folks watched that, that program June 11th, and the next morning, um, Americans across the country woke up to the devastating news that Evers had been assassinated. And so these women who were sympathetic, um, who had been reading information about Mrs. Evers and Mr. Evers, um, wrote immediately to Mrs. Evers, expressing their sadness, but also their connection with her as wives, as mothers. And these letters offer me access to why these women might later have gone on to participate in benevolent projects. Um, many of these women expressed various types of encouragement, encouraging Mrs. Evers to walk tall and try to remember that the pain in her heart was uh, felt by many women like her. Um, and they also do some interesting work of distancing themselves from Southern white supremacist violence, talking about the fact that the assassin was a minority um, of the race. They really try not to kind of understand this, this instance within this legacy of racial violence that had long existed in the U.S. But most women are doing the work of trying to connect and understand um, their relationship and connect with Mrs. Evers through their kinship to her as women and mothers. Most of these sympathy writers, um, their race is clear because they say so. And they say so as this kind of expression of, of guilt and shame. They talk quite a bit about watching um, the, the programs or reading the profiles in the New York Times um, and praying that one day that um, everyone kind of sees African-Americans and, and sees that um, one woman says, I am ashamed of my race and I hope that someday we may be worthy in God's eyes to be called your equals. And so they're doing a lot of kind of personal personal work, um, even within their their letter writing, their feelings of shame and horrors of of discovering the the racism, perhaps willful ignorance to what was happening. But many of these these sympathy writers um, are attempting to kind of 
comfort and soothe themselves um, and to, and their letters to Mrs. Evers. One woman um, from Chicago says, believe me, most American people are in sympathy with the color cause. And then she goes on to beg Mrs. Evers um, not to hate all white people. This sentiment is common in these sympathy letters. And I argue in so many cases that much of the, the sympathy work that these women do um, while they express their sympathy, it really is functioning like a boomerang in some ways that so much of their sympathy comes back to soothe themselves, to soothe their own conscience. They are requesting absolution from Mrs. Evers while she is grieving herself. And I can only imagine what Mrs. Evers is feeling as she's reading these letters. And her biography speaks a bit about um, her feelings immediately after what's happening. But these letters reveal the kind of inappropriate pleading and sometimes the kind of subtle racism and classism that these women who are attempting to sympathize wrote within their comments. Some writers at the same time were attempting to kind of figure out what they could do to move the country in a direction of justice. Um, a few women talked about cooperating with integration and their own communities contributing to their NAACP chapter. One woman in California said, I cannot let your husband's death be for nothing. I am trying in my own neighborhood to make them understand. And for her, that was the least and most she felt she could do in this moment. And so these white women outsiders who were liberal minded yet desired to participate in the movement um, while preserving their own safety and in some ways to make themselves feel, feel better about um, their participation um, in white supremacist violence. Um, many had turned their be benevolence into a form of self-satisfaction and ethical validation through some of the benevolence work that they were doing out through the home. And so the archive, both the Evers collection um, and both Mrs. Evers biography really helped me to kind of think about how sympathy and empathy were functioning during the movement how those outsiders were negotiating for themselves their contributions to the movement and how did the movement, how the movement was attempting to raise consciousness for folks outside of the South and how that looked different for black and white women based on class, based on region. While the majority of my work is really thinking about how black women are engaging with collecting food and clothing, um, for their children or getting in the car with a stranger to attempt to vote or what it might have looked like for them to use the postal system to acquire these survival goods from outsiders while being denied state welfare from various agencies or being denied survival goods, as Bobby was speaking about, from White Citizens Council. Um, it might have been that subversive act of these Black women writing letters to sympathetic outsiders. And for some of these outsiders, um, like white women in New York or Vermont, some of their first engagement might have looked like writing a letter to someone in the South with the promise to raise awareness. And much of, much of that work for many of these women might have looked like the slow communal work of filling up boxes of shoes um, filled with boxes full of shoes and socks and cornmeal or school supplies to poor families in Mississippi. And so I think this is the kind of everyday world that thinking about sympathy and emotion and like Bobby thinking about survival goods and food opens up a world where we can think about how various Americans are engaging within the movement in ways that their lives allowed. And as we grow to understand these worlds more fully and complicate them, um, we can see the broad ways that women, Black women, especially in Mississippi, are pulling together resources through the postal systems, how they're navigating white um, almsgivers' uh, own kind of language within their, their, their letters, and how Black women are, are pulling together these resources to get their freedom. And I also think just thinking about how race and sympathy functions and the reality that sympathy is not enough um, and that sympathy does more for the person expressing it than it does to advance the movement, I think it helps us um, kind of understand the racial dynamics 
in our contemporary moment when it comes to racial justice issues today. And so those worlds were open up to me um, in engaging with the Evers Archive. And so I'm just so thankful for, for the family for allowing these materials to be researched um, and looked into in this way. Um, and so with that, I will I will turn it over um, back to, to the audience for, for questions of, of me and the other panelists. We'll let all of our Zoomers get back on screen. But yes, we have time for a few questions. If you have a question, you can raise your hand. I'll bring the mic to you, and you can ask it of whomever. Yep. Uh, let me uh, let's say, first of all, I, I, I like these topics. I think this is good. Uh, as a professor, this excites me. But my, my question has nothing to do with any of these topics. Uh, I'm just curious. <laughs> I'm just curious, um, I, I've always wondered about, um, and, and I've read enough to know that there's some things missing, but I've always wondered about the, the connection and the role of Dr. Theodore Roosevelt uh, Mason, uh, Mason Howard on uh, both uh, Murley and, and uh, Megger. If you are in your efforts in terms of your particular uh, areas, if you perhaps ran across some documentation and became curious, who is this person and what was his role and so forth, Dr. Theodore Roosevelt Mason Howard. Yeah, Dr. T.R.M. Howard, right. Anyone? Yeah, I'm happy to start, um, and then we can go into it. Um, so for me, uh, Dr. T.M.R. Howard um, became, a, so when I first got to Mississippi and I was learning about the story of Megar Evers, so first off, I learned about Megar Evers through the movie Ghost of Mississippi. So if anyone's seen the movie Ghost of Mississippi, then that's the first time I ever learned about Megar Evers. And for me, that movie was really important to me. So that was the only story I knew, and of course that movie is about how um, about the assassination of Megar Evers and how his assassination was brought to justice, of course, decades later. And of course, uh, Merle Evers, um, her role in ensuring that that came to be, and of course, Jerry Mitchell, people like that. So I have to say is that when I got to Mississippi and learned about the story of Megar Evers, I learned about his time when he was in Mount Bayou. And that's where that's where TMR Howard became a figure. For me, uh, what we do know is that TMR Howard hired Megar Evers and Merle to work for, I believe it was the Magnolia um, insurance company at the time. So that's as much as I know about TMR Howard. I do know that also he, I forget the name of the organization that he founded that kind of precedes the, the 1960s, late 1950s, uh, the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. Um, but for me, that's the only part that he comes up into my story um, when I'm thinking about um, the time when the Evers were in Mount Bayou um, doing work both for the insurance company, but also when, when you read for us the living, we also learn by day Megar Evers was selling insurance, and then by night he was also trying to organize on plantations. And he also used his role as an insurance agent to also go to plantations to sell insurance, but it was also subversive because he was also uh, organizing around freedom. So that's the only time that TMR Howard um, came up, in, in, particularly in my time in Mississippi. Other questions? Great afternoon. I was fascinated with the conversation about the um, issue of food when it comes to the civil rights movement. Can any of you speak to, I, I'm new to, well, I'm not a native Mississippian. I've been here uh, for a while now. But I understand that there was a um, period of time where eminent domain was implemented to uh, take land from black farmers, however nothing was, is, or planned to do with the land. It just literally stopped them from being able to earn a living and to produce food in a agricultural rich state. So can any of you speak to that? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'm happy to kick it off again. <laughs> this is like a question that would be for, for me. Um, 
I am a scholar of the African-American agricultural and food experience. So we're thinking about the story of black farmers. So there's no way I can even adequately capture um, the story of black farmers, at least from the 1920s through today and thinking about black land loss. Uh, what we do know is that there are a number of black farmers who still own land um, in Mississippi and they're organizing in organizations like the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, the Mississippi Association of Cooperatives. So the food question, the grand question uh, becomes important because during the civil rights movement, another side of it was that they not only organized around voting rights for like uh, for like county board supervisors and local offices, they also organized around um, agricultural positions. So that's kind of predates Pete Daniels in his book called Dispossession. He gets into thinking about some of these earlier conversations around black farmers. And the thing around land is that land is such a particularly interesting conversation in life. Because while you know, from black farmers in a number of ways, there's also been a number of black farmers who kept the land. And we tend not to focus on those who kept the land. So when we think about this food question, the grain question, we can we can the, the story and the history. But also we recognize that there are a number of people who are still organizing today, and they're organizing around these movements called food justice and food sovereignty. And those movements provide a space to use food and agriculture as a way to address issues of inequities across race, class, gender, sexuality, and other different identities. So the story around food and ag, you know, put simply, is that it's an ongoing story, and it's hard to provide a commentary on the idea of land, because while in the domain is one way land was taken away, we also know that extension service played a major role in it, banks played a major role in it, um, local policies played a major role in it. Uh, plantation owners who are also businessmen played a major role on like planning in different counties and things like that. So I hope that kind of gets at the, your question. We have a question from the live stream <clears throat> for all of our panelists. And it is, uh, what were you surprised to find in the Evers collection? I'll jump in right here. Um, for me, I think that just the the breadth and the sort of the the um, all of the photographs, I think, and and the personal letters. I always kind of think back to that um, and think about sort of holding, you know, having access to those documents and just reading through. Um, and even for me, you know, like even in one of my chapter about the Freedom Riders is really not about the Freedom Riders, it's about black girls and women who were incarcerated with Freedom Riders. And so, um, and so through these Freedom Riders, those women and those girls stories are told. And so one of the, the things that, one of the documents that I, I came across was a letter, right? That someone, um, a, a young African-American girl had written um, to the NAACP um, talking about some of the issues that she was um, enduring at Parchment. And she said that she had tried to reach out to a lot of people um, and that no one was listening and she was asking for help. And she basically was saying that she knew people on the inside were telling her, you have to reach out to the NAACP. And so I never was expecting to, to find, you know, something that, you know, something like that, that really helped me continue to think about um, those women in the 1950s and 1960s that found themselves not a part of the movement, right, but were trying to figure out, even while they were enduring such harshness at Parchment, but still trying to figure out a way that they could help the movement. And these are just local Mississippi women, right, and girls, and they knew what was going on on the outside, and so they were trying to figure out how to get help, but also how they could help. And I'll just echo um, Dion's comments around the correspondence. I think like correspondence is such a deeply, in so many cases, personal um, interior component of, of the lives of these people that we study. Um, and I think coming across this various correspondence, both written by Mrs. Evers and also those that were, that were written to her, um, I think really kind of, for me, opened up these avenues to say we need to be thinking about emotion. We need to be thinking about 
how empathy is functioning within the movement across these various lines of race, class, gender, social position. And so I was not expecting um, to find, you know, I, I had written a little bit in my application about wanting to look at sympathy letters, but also wanting to spend a lot of time looking at um, the MFDP and Delta Ministry and all these other collections. But there were hundreds of thousands of letters written to Mrs. Evers from across the country that were, you know, these various emotional pills. And I think that there is something something to that. There are there are many um, I think this opens more areas and doors for us to think broadly about various movements, about various women who are connected to the movement, um, who receive correspondence from across the country in the way that emotion is a part of the way that, you know, various appeals and the ways that people were drawn to the movement and how they contributed materially. And so the correspondence was just so expansive. Um, that I've been looking for another opportunity to get another trip to the archive because, um, you know, and the, the generosity to kind of place that correspondence in the archive is also kind of telling of the family. And so it's really just such a gift to kind of have for me to use that correspondence and the, that the areas of inquiry um, that it opened up for me have been really impactful and, and the direction that I've taken my scholarship. Briefly, I'll, I'll tell them that I agree. The correspondence, and, and for me, when I came to Mississippi, I wanted to tell both sides of the story. We often think about what proponents of the movement have done, how they organize marches and organize programs, but I also want to know the forces that worked against the movement, those members of the White Citizens Council, those who were politicians, and those who actually were at the top of um, the power the power um, hierarchy of Mississippi. So for me, what I what, what surprised me the most bigger Everett's investigations were I mean, he was able to 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 investigate the White Citizens Council the way that he did and provide that information to the NAACP provides a very important, often missing narrative in our story when we think about the other side, those who were against, because the movement is it's, it's like this this tug of war, this battle of power. So it's those who are for the movement, but also those who are against the movement. And, and when reading the Everett copy and reading some correspondences around Megar Evans and NAACP, really surprised me how expansive their knowledge was of what was going on on the We don't know about in the archives. Rena, this is the 60th anniversary week, y'all have um, events planned over the next several days. Would you say a few words about what all you do have coming up? Yes, I will, Chris, but first I just have to thank Pamela, Dion, and Bobby. Um, I wanted to see you in person. Uh, it, it will happen because I want you all back. Uh, you you have shown us, you've shown our family uh, just such generous interests and have explored all the different areas that uh, people don't necessarily think about with my, with my father and my mother. And so thank you for your research, but really thank you for your heart and the presentations that you are doing and congratulations on your books. Books, plural, for all of you, because I know they're all coming. And um, for everyone, please join us. I guess I'm supposed to stand up. <laughs> um, please join us this week. Uh, we are doing other special um, uh, speaker series that are coming on Friday. But tomorrow, we're honoring my mother and it is going to be at the brunch. It's more than a widow brunch. It's going to be at the Sheraton Flowood at, at 11 now. And uh, we want you to come and just enjoy. And we want her to just see your wonderful faces and feel your wonderful spirit. We also have um, not only just tomorrow with the brunch, we are going to be at our old house, 
which is a national monument, and that starts tomorrow at 10 a.m. with the National Park Service doing such a wonderful job of grand opening. So please join us there. And then on Friday, we will have two speaker series going. One that is media in the movement with different panelists. Um, and it will be held at Millsaps College. And then we also have economic justice also at Millsaps. And it starts at 1 o'clock and they piggyback on each other. Then a little later on that evening, we're gonna just have fun, and we're going to highlight the voices of courage and justice, all of them, all around. And you can't, there's so many millions of them, but we just wanna highlight some. And so come and join us to say hello to ones that are local and ones that are national and ones that have gone before us. So that's what's happening, and that's gonna be at the Jackson Convention Complex at 7 p.m. Thank you, Chris, for an outstanding job with all of History is Lunch, but thank you for this opportunity. No, thank you, and look, thank you all for being here. If uh, you would like to read a little bit more about some of these topics, we have the, um, Autobiography of Medgar Evers and For Us the Living, both written by Merle Evers. We have Michael Vincent Williams' excellent biography. Um, we have the This Is Home exhibit upstairs. Please don't get away without seeing that today. Um, and as Rena noted, there are some books that are in the works, but there's one that has been submitted and is going to be printed in August, and so come back on September 6th when Bobby Smith will be here for a History as a Lunch by himself on his book. Um, thank you all for being here today. What a great day. I hope that we see you at several of these events. Help me thank Pam Walker.